Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Beverly Spencer. I'm a program planner with the Law Society. Uh, we're still expecting a number of people here this morning, but let's get started because we have a pretty full morning. I'm just going to say a couple of words before we uh, begin. Uh, first of all, I always make a point uh, to thank our faculty uh, first off because without the hard work of a lot of dedicated people, CLE simply wouldn't happen. And I have to say in this case, our faculty has gone the extra mile because we have an exceptional session planned for you today. And um, I think you'll see their hard work reflected in the quality of the materials and the presentations. Uh, second, please take some time and fill out the evaluations in your binders. They're very important to us in developing future programming. And we do take each and every one seriously and make sure we read every one. So take a few minutes to do that. And finally, I'd just like to introduce our chair for this morning. Greg Frenette is a partner in the Toronto office of Blake, Castles and Graydon, specializing in the areas of corporate and commercial law and emphasizing mergers, acquisitions and restructurings. Uh, his clients include regional, national and international companies in the financial services, pharmaceutical, manufacturing and distribution industries. And his publications include core security documents, debentures, pledge agreements, general security agreements and more acceptance of tenders, some pitfalls to avoid, buying from a receiver, and indemnities and related topics. Please help me welcome Greg Frenette. Um, thanks, uh, Beverly. Um, I think we do have a good program for you today. Uh, it's one I'm quite interested in. Uh, I, I think uh, we have the benefit of having um, one uh, topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts, buying and selling a business. I think most of us in the room would describe ourselves as corporate and commercial lawyers. Uh, and if you are a corporate and commercial lawyer, I think the heart of our business, the bread and butter of what we do is buying and selling businesses. Uh, whether you come from a large law firm, a small law firm, uh, or a medium-sized firm, all of us have, if we have business clients, if we have commercial clients, sometime in the, in the span that we're advising them, they're either going to be selling their business or buying another one, and hopefully more than once. So it's something we all do. and. Uh, uh, I think it's also important because it, it ties together a lot of the things we learn as lawyers. Um, it, it forces us to be general practitioners in the true sense of the word. Um, e at a large law firm, you can have experts helping you in lots of different areas. You can have somebody helping you with tax, with trademarks, with intellectual property, and we'll have a lot of those people talk to us today. But if you describe yourself as someone who does buying and selling a business, if you describe yourself as a corporate and commercial lawyer, you have to know at least a little bit about all of those topics. You have to know enough to be able to negotiate a transaction. You need to know enough to be able to advise your client. So you have to have a pretty wide uh, range of knowledge. And, and I think that's, um, at its best, what a corporate and commercial lawyer does. And it comes out to its fullest, I think, um, when we describe the topic of buying and selling a business. Um, the other reason I think today's topic is timely is uh, you don't have to be a careful reader of the business press to realize there's been uh, a revolution in the way that business is being carried on uh, over the last two years, and I think the pace of it is just increasing. Um, I, I had a look at the report on business this morning and at the Financial Post, uh, and I counted up the number of articles dealing with internet and e-commerce. And there were 517 articles on, on internet and e-commerce. There were only four articles that weren't on in, internet and e-commerce, actually. And three of them had to do with BREX. And the other one had to do with interest rates. But um, it's, it's all you read in the press. It's all you, it's, it's all you see in the business papers. Um, it's, it's a sea change in the way we're conducting business. Uh, and it's not being led, I don't think, by our large clients. It's not being led by mega firms. Uh, instead, this is a revolution that's happening more at the grassroots level. It's, it's uh, entrepreneurs, it's uh, younger people, so it's clients that I think we see uh, in all of our practices, um, and it's something that I think uh, that uh, all of us have to become uh, educated in if we're going to keep up to date with our clients. Um, and so we brought together some experts in this area today. It was something I wanted to learn more about. Uh, as I said, I'm a general practitioner, so I don't have uh, and didn't have uh, expert knowledge in these areas. So uh, with the Law Society, we went out and, and uh, found uh, some of the people that we believed were most up to date in this area uh, to talk to us this morning. Um, another thing that we're doing today that I think you'll find interesting is we're going to try and use a case study approach. Uh, rather than just uh, lecturing, and, and we'll, some of the speakers are able to, to sort of uh, bring their topics uh, more closely aligned with the case study. 
uh, but I think it'll be useful for everybody to spend a few minutes. If you haven't done so already, uh, you should read while I continue to talk. But the case study is found under tab number one uh, in the materials. It's only two or three pages long. And, and what we're going to really do today is, is consider ourselves acting uh, for a buyer um, who's looking to buy a business, uh, a company called Cyber Store Inc. Um, and find the fact situation and uh, read through it. Uh, and we'll talk about it more as the day goes on. Um, it's fairly, uh, it, it's an interesting fact situation. Uh, it's a hypothetical one, but uh, if you paid attention to the business press or the, if, if you know a bit about the music and recording industry, uh, you'll recognize that the, the fact situation bears some relationship to what's actually happening in the real world. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll get on with the, um, uh, today's program. Uh, and our first speaker today is, is Stan Friedman. Um, as I said, we're going we're, we're gonna to look at the, the subtitle of today's program is uh, Buying and Selling a Business in the Age of E-Commerce. Uh, but buying and selling a business, the building blocks are still the same as they were five years ago and ten years ago. Uh, we still need to know the tax situation. We still need to know the basic commercial issues. Um, and in every transaction that I've been involved with lately, uh, I've found that it starts off with a letter of intent. Um, and that's a way for me to clarify my thinking and a way, I think, for clients to clarify their thinking to see whether they have a deal. So we're going to start off the morning with Stan talking to us about uh, letters of intent and their use uh, in uh, commercial transactions and in buying and selling business in particular. Uh, Stan is a partner at, at uh, the firm of Bresver Grossman. Um, he's been very active in uh, working for the Law Society and for the Bar Admission uh, uh, program for a number of years. Uh, he's the assistant head of section for the business law program uh, in the bar admission course. Uh, he's also the one who's revised and edited uh, many of the corporate and commercial materials in the uh, business law reference materials uh, in the law society, so I think he's well qualified to speak to us this morning. Uh, Stan? morning. Thanks, Greg. Can everyone uh, hear me okay? As Greg mentioned, I'm here to today to talk to you about letters of intent and other pre-contractual, that is, pre-definitive instruments. Now, the users of a letter of intent may not only acquire rights, but incur obligations and liabilities, some intended, and as I point out in my paper, some unintended. Hopefully, I can suggest some means by which undesired or unintended results uh, can be avoided and desired or intended results can be achieved. Now, a discussion of letters intent and other pre-contractual documents is to a large extent a discussion of contract formation. This is a topic which is the subject of countless, uh, if you ever did a search, you'd hit thousands of cases, and a major portion of all contract textbooks. It is not a simple area. Letters of intent have, I believe, become increasingly important for several reasons. First, awareness of the difficulties and importance of letters of intent has increased because of some spectacular litigation in both Canada and the United States. In the United States, there was the infamous Pennzoil and Texaco case. While perhaps not significant for its jurisprudence, the sheer size of the claim, over $10 billion, and the structural effect uh, of the settlement on a major U.S. industry, the oil industry, makes its economic importance undeniable. In Canada, more recently, there was the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in Lac and Corona, where pre-contractual discussions led to a finding of breach of confidence and the result where one mining company had to turn, physically turn over a mine to another. Another reason I believe letters of intent have become increasingly important is because of their increasing use in recent years. There would, be several ask, there would seem to be several reasons for this in modern business transactions. First, modern business transactions are characterized by increasing complexity and size. Large transactions are enormously complex and the legal agreements that deal with them can, be, can occupy volumes. The negotiation of such contracts can be a very lengthy process. In the, 
In addition to the necessity of agreeing on a myriad of details, the participation of third parties, such as financial institutions, governmental officials, subcontractors, and consultants in the negotiations is essential. Therefore, the participating parties desire to at least document their serious intention or the parameters of the negotiation at an early stage through the use of a letter of intent. Another factor causing an increased use of letters of intent is the internationalization of the world's economy. This has resulted in an increasing number of transactions that involve parties that are foreign to each other. Su since such parties are the product of different cultures and legal systems, they may have only a vague idea of the ethical and legal effects of their negotiations. Such insecurity creates an understandable desire to reduce negotiations to writing at a very early stage so that the participants can understand their rights and their obligations. Another factor is the emphasis on information technology, intellectual property, e-commerce, and the internet. Basically, we've also seemed to have gone to a business without borders. Now, as Greg said, this is going to be the focus of much of the presentations today. This new emphasis involving many uncharted areas of the law and areas in which many clients and their advisors, including us as lawyers, do not have a full understanding of what they are doing or how to affect a transaction. Again, this creates an understandable desire to reduce negotiations to writing at a very early stage before getting into an a myriad of issues and details. The, par the participants would at least like to know whether there is something to talk about. They may not know exactly what they are talking about, they may not know how to get to the result, but they do know that they want to enter into a negotiation, if not a transaction, for their mutual benefit. In short, by documenting their intent or the status of the negotiations, the parties can confirm whether there is a sufficient consensus to form the basis of an agreement or to set the ground rules by which they will negotiate a formal or definitive agreement. As an aside, there are other pre-contractual documents uh, which assist in the negotiating process, uh, including confidentiality agreements, access or due diligence agreements, standstill agreements, negotiation exclusivity agreements, expense agreements, breakup agreements, lockup agreements, you can keep going down the list. These other pre-definitive uh, agreement documents can be standalone or often are incorporated as part of a letter of intent. And I'll be talking a little more about those types of provisions later. While letters of intent may be an initial or intermediate step toward a definitive or final contract, it is often not appreciated that a letter of intent may be contractual in itself. Not all letters of intent are mere understandings which do not create legal obligations. While some letters of intent create unintended legal obligations, many do intend to create legal obligations. Although letters of intent are pre-contractual, that is, prior to the definitive, comprehensive, or formal agreement, letters of intent can create legal obligations and therefore have to be considered carefully. For instance, if we look at Pennzoil and Lack, in Pennzoil in Texaco, which, result, which gave Texaco a very unintended result, the perils of executing a document not clear as to intent and effect is highlighted. In Lack, you can see the focus on the problems of negotiating without clear guidelines. The lessons to be learned are that when an understanding or agreement is reached and reduced to writing, care must be taken to ensure that the words accurately reflect the true intention of the parties. If the matter is not reduced to writing, then the parties should be careful in their words and actions since they may create obligations and duties. Letters of intent have a history of being vague and ambiguous, many times because they arise from informal exchanges of correspondence or documents without the input of lawyers. However, it would be naive to believe that the documents do not reflect, when they are vague and ambiguous, the party's true intentions. I'm sure most of you have seen clients desire to maintain maximum flexibility and discretion for themselves, but want to bind the other side. 
if you will, they want to have their cake and eat it too. In turning to the substance of a letter of intent and structuring one, I want to spend a moment on parties. Who should be the parties to a letter of intent? Now, in a situation in which there is a non-binding letter of intent, you may not have that much concern as to who the parties are. After all, there's nothing that binds anybody. However, if there are provisions which are intended to be binding, such as access, confidentiality, or negotiation exclusivity, then the persons who are intended to be bound by those provisions should be the signatories. Now, while phrases such as in trust or in trust for a corporation to be incorporated are often utilized, are often utilized just for expediency, these phrases are also often used in the belief that the signatory will avoid any personal liability. The, phrase, the use of such phrases, again, as in trust or in trust for a company to be incorporated, do not necessarily avoid personal liability. A person who purports to contract as a trustee, rather than in a personal capacity, must expressly and unequivocally state this in order to avoid personal liability. The mere use of words such as in trust may be insufficient to exclude that personal liability. It's clear from the cases that there is no magic to the words such as in trust by themselves. Unless there is a Seskica trust or the purported trustee is truly acting as agent for some other person, there will be no relief from personal liability. Another issue I want to briefly highlight is the formalities brought through Section 21 of the Ontario Business Corporations Act and the comparable provision in the CBCA, Section 14. Those provisions deal with pre-incorporation contracts. Now, at common law, a corporation could not ratify or adopt a contract entered into prior to coming in, its coming into existence. By virtue of statute, it now can. However, there are formalities in both of those statutes which must be followed in order for a contract to be incorporated, and sorry, for a contract to be adopted. If those formalities are not followed, the promoter will remain liable. And there are several cases in which promoters have been uh, found to be liable because the formalities were not uh, followed. While the, speed for, while the need for speed in business transactions is recognized, and often at a preliminary stage, the parties do not want to go through the time and expense of setting up a new entity, whether it be a corporation or partnership, uh, to complete a transaction, which they do not even know yet if it's going to be completed. Negative consequences may ensue from a lack of clarification of who the parties to a transaction are and who is intended to be bound or obligated. Now, for the purpose of the discussion, letters of intent can be broken down into two basic categories and a third hybrid category, and that's binding, non-binding, and some type of combination or hybrid uh, letter of intent. Now, you would think that drafting a letter of intent which is binding, or a letter of intent which is not binding, or a hybrid should be relatively easy. However, for a variety of reasons, including confused or contradictory underlying motives, there are many ambiguous, vague, and uncertain letters of intent. Caution is required, as drafting a vague and ambiguous letter of intent may cause more problems for a client than it resolves. The client may, for instance, end up with an enforceable agreement to which he or she did not intend to be legally bound. Now, let me start briefly with non-binding letters of intent. Although letters of intent can vary considerably in their content and format due to the varied nature and size of transactions, most, if not all, non-binding letters of intent set forth the proposed basic structure of the transaction. <clears throat> Apart from setting out the subject matter of the transaction, that is, what is being bought and sold, other issues dealt with may include the purchase price, or the method by which the purchase price is to be determined. Payment of the purchase price, security for the purchase price being paid after closing, and the like. Now other provisions can also mirror those you would typically find in 
an agreement of purchase and sale, including the reps and warranties, conditions, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me for a second. Another benefit from non-binding letters of intent is upfront they can highlight the problem areas of a potential transaction. These can include problematical third-party consents, year 2000 type issues, environmental concerns, and so on. Now, often phrases such as subject to contract or subject to the preparation execution of a formal agreement are utilized to indicate the non-binding nature of the letter of intent. Are such subject to, if you will, clauses uh, sufficient to indicate that a document is not intended to constitute a binding agreement? The cases indicate that such words are not clear enough by themselves to indicate an intent that those be non-binding letters of intent. In order to ensure that a letter of intent is non-binding, the parties must clearly and unequivocally express their intention not to be bound by the document. Of course, the opposite is true as well. If the letter of intent is intended to be binding and is not to be substantially affected by the execution of a subsequent definitive agreement, then the binding letter of intent should say so. There is no magic to the formulation of the wording used in a non-binding letter of intent. Uh, I've given an example in, both in the body of the paper and in the appendix to the papers of some of the formulations to indicate whether a letter of intent is to be binding or non-binding. The safest course is to state not only that the matters are conditional, but also to explicitly provide that the letter of intent does not constitute a binding agreement. In other words, be obvious about it, state it. <coughs> I'd like to turn now to binding letters of intent and the binding provisions of a letter of intent. Now, occasionally, letters of intent, as I've said, are intended by the parties to be binding. In such instances, letters of intent may, in fact, be agreements of purchase and sale. The danger of a binding letter of intent that is merely skeletal or omits certain provisions is that a court may be reluctant to, to enforce the agreement because the agreement is too uncertain to be enforceable. Letters of intent may be held to be unenforceable because of vagueness or because they lack essential terms. Typically, typically, however, letters of intent which are binding provide a framework for future negotiations by dealing with matters ancillary to the substance of the proposed transaction. These matters which are usually unrelated to the outcome of the negotiation of the transaction, and which, as said, can be reduced to separate documents, include, for example, confidentiality provisions, exclusive negotiation, access, and the like. I'd like to spend a couple moments talking in particular about two of those types of provisions, the due diligence or access provisions, and the quid pro quo for that, confidentiality. For a variety of reasons at a preliminary stage, including confirming assumptions, corroborating assurances, and investigation, a purchaser offer often requires access to the asset, books, and records of a target business or corporation. Provision of access can be difficult for a purchaser for several reasons. The vendor or the seller may want assurances that its business operations will not be disrupted. If the proposed transaction is secret and the vendor does not want its employees or others to know about it, then proper assurances will be required. A most important concern, however, seems to be with the confidentiality of what is obtained or seen by the proposed purchaser in the review investigation. Purchaser, of course, will not, the vendor, of course, will not want to have the purchaser see its trade secrets without having the assurance that there will be a completed deal. 
where there is confidential information and particularly intellectual property involved, access and the nature of the due diligence process is not an easy issue. For competitive reasons, access may have to be limited or phased, with some of the disclosure occurring only after an ex executed agreement of purchase and sale has been exchanged. For instance, and I give this example in the paper, if you're dealing with sensitive software, you may only allow a prospective purchaser to actually see the software in operation. You will not show them the source code. Once they are happy with it in operation and they've signed a definitive agreement of purchase and sale, only then may be it necessary for them to see the source code. Again, part of the problem here is once somebody has seen something, how do you purge it from their head? For a prospective purchaser, there would also be some advantage in not seeing everything. Because once they've seen it, and let's say the transaction doesn't go ahead, they will be later accused of using something improperly or of stealing a trade secret. If they've never seen it, they can't be accused of taking it. And that may be notwithstanding a confidentiality agreement. Because how do you prove where somebody got something? It can be a very difficult evidentiary matter. In dealing with the issue of confidentiality, I can't stress enough that, as well as it can be done, that people clearly define what is or what constitutes confidential information. If there's a debate, oftentimes everything that is confidential will be designated as confidential. It'll be stamped confidential, so there's no question of what's uh, not to be revealed and what, is, uh, what can be revealed. Now, when we're going to be talking today about a particular type, we have a particular fact situation today, and I'm going to briefly highlight a couple things that may come out in a letter of intent and why you'd use a letter of intent to deal with them. Let's, for instance, deal with particular hardware and software used in computer business or computer technology. Often today, and I'm going to say this as a background, we're all used to buying widgets, the classic law school example. We're all used to manufacturing concerns, and we all grew up that way, and we all understand them. We're in a new area with new technology, new uncharted laws, boundless world or borderless world, and we don't really understand fully what we're dealing with. Hopefully by the end of the day we'll know a little more, but we don't know really what we're dealing with. So it makes it much easier to deal with it up front before clients start spending a lot of money on definitive agreements and due diligence afterwards to deal with it at a preliminary stage. Part of the problem in any transaction is what are you buying and selling? Now you may be buying something such as a piece of hardware or software in operation, but who owns it? Typically you'd like to think the vendor, but as we all know, the components of many technolo technological devices today are comprised of other technology in which people have a proprietary interest. Perhaps it's licensed, perhaps it was purchased, perhaps it was developed by people on staff, perhaps it was developed by people under contract. And through today, we'll learn that there's a lot of concerns with how technology was developed, what it's comprised of, and how to deal with that in an agreement. For the purpose of a letter of intent, you can understand those elements at an earlier stage, both for the vendor and the purchaser, and deal with them up front. In buying and selling the business, it's trying to, set, it's tried to say, what does your client want? Are they buying a balance sheet or are they buying some technology? Often today, we're not buying a balance sheet. We're not buying profits. We're not buying hard assets. We're buying a piece of software, perhaps with copyright. We're buying a piece of hard, uh, some new type of hardware, or even more difficultly, we're buying people. Letter of intent up front highlights what it is you're buying and selling so that the purchaser and vendor understand that they're on the same wavelength. The purchaser may think, uh, it's selling a balance sheet and the vendor may say no I'm buying people and technology. It leads to a different type of an agreement with different types of concerns. It also leads to a different valuation in dealing with the purchase price. Recently I was involved in a transaction which involved four or five hundred PCs. When they went in, now they weren't buying it just for the, uh, they were buying it in part for the technology but they were mostly buying the business for the people. However, when they did go in, they found out most of these were 486s, two-thirds of which had to be replaced fairly quickly. 
most of the software on the computers was uh, improperly uh, licensed. In fact, it wasn't licensed at all. It had just been copied. They also found that it was virus-ridden computers. And they also found there was a lot of illegal software on the computers. The net cost of all that to fix it up was $700,000. On a $3 million purchase, that was a, sub a substantial reduction. By dealing with it at the letter of intent stage, it was much easier. It caused the transaction nearly to crater, but people hadn't expended a lot of money, and the some of the big problems as to what was being bought and sold were worked out at an earlier stage. Again, through a letter of intent and some of the concerns or issues it may highlight, it'll make it easier to draft the agreement of purchase and sale, and as we'll see through the day, customizing the representations and warranties and other conditions for the transaction. Now, I want to spend uh, a moment talking about drafting hybrids, uh, hybrid letters of intent, which is probably the most common type of letter of intent, and that's a letter of intent where some provisions are binding and some are not. Again, it's unusual to see a letter of intent that's wholly un not binding and a letter of intent that's wholly binding. If provisions are not intended to be binding, again, I can't reinforce this enough, the letter of intent should expressly state which provisions are not contractual and which are contractual. Again, as I've said, subject to contract is not sufficient. Now, I've given some examples uh, in the paper, and it doesn't, I don't think, really matter which form you use. But I can't tell you enough times, again, you'll see this in a lot of the cases, where it is unclear what is binding, what is not binding, what did the parties intend. The easiest way is simply to identify specifically what is binding and what is not binding. Another issue I want to briefly highlight is agreements to agree in good faith. As we all know, we're in a less and less of a world with borders, and some of those influence from, influences from down south, from the United States, keep creeping up here. Many letters of intent contemplate that the parties will agree on an issue at some, type in the some time in the future, or that the parties will negotiate in good faith to resolve issues. Basically, the Canadian courts take an all-or-nothing approach to letters of intent and the obligations to bargain in good faith. They are either a complete contract to consummate a transaction containing all essential uh, terms, or they are not legally binding. A legally binding obligation to bargain in good faith is not recognized where there is no binding agreement. That's the basic Canadian position. It is different in the United States. By the way, Canada lines up with England. Similarly, the courts do not recognize a contract to negotiate or an agreement to agree. Oral negotiations and agreements. And this has become a particular concern, particularly in light of lack in corona. Now, there's a general view amongst clients that oral agreements are unenforceable. As you all know, that is not necessarily true. The courts will enforce oral agreements, including those for the purchase and sale of a business. Statute of frauds type issues are generally not relevant in purchase and sale issues. So, just as there can be a danger in reducing matters formally to writing, there can also be a danger in failing to do so. If, by not reducing matters to writing, clients believe they cannot be found to have created an agreement, the cases clearly indicate that this is not so, even in complex transactions involving the purchase and sale of a business. Therefore, a letter of intent can serve a useful purpose by clearly stating that the parties do not intend to create a binding agreement until the formal agreement of purchase and sale is executed and delivered and avoid a binding agreement being found by a court which terms, with terms that a party finds unacceptable. In conclusion, letters of intent and pre-contractual documents are important aspects of buying and selling a business. They may vary considerably in form and substance, yet for the drafter of such documents, the issue is simple, although its implementation may be difficult. 
what is the intention of the parties. With careful drafting, it is hoped misunderstandings, which are going to result in litigation, and unintended agreements can be avoided. As I point out in the paper, the pre-contractual phase in the purchase and sale of a business can be very dangerous. The irony of the situation is that only if there is no definitive agreement will there be lit litigation. While pre-contractual documents may be helpful in leading to a successful completion of a purchase and sale of a business, they can also be just as helpful to protect the parties if the transaction does not close. Thank you. Are there any questions? I think we're doing questions as each person speaks. Well, Stan said sometimes the problem is not only knowing um, whether you want your agreement to be binding or not binding, but implementing that intention. I was involved in a case a couple of years ago where uh, we had negotiated a very long letter of intent that was quite detailed, and at the last minute uh, we were acting for the buyers, and um, the, the fact situation was not a lot different than our cyber store example. It was a young technology company who needed some capital. Uh, so our, our clients wanted to put some money in, so we I looked at the, at the letter of intent and it was pretty detailed and I thought it was, so we put a clause in saying that notwithstanding it was that if we anticipated further uh, documentation that this was intended to be a binding agreement. And of course you all know what happened next is we put some money in, uh, we, we couldn't reach a definitive agreement and uh, ended up in court um, the, where uh, in, the, in a U.S. federal court in California where a judge decided that although we had a lot of the detail down, we didn't have down the length of term that the employment contract was supposed to run for the, one of the principals who was selling out. And because we didn't have the term of the employment contract, um, he declined to give us an injunction at least. And so we may still decide at trial whether we really did have a, a binding agreement or not. But um, uh, it is an area where there is uh, a lot of risk. And it's always funny, once you've been uh, involved in a case that's gone bad, uh, it tends to focus your attention on, uh, on those aspects in the future. Um, I told you today that one of the areas that, that um, for general practitioners like Stan and Curtis and myself, uh, we think we know a lot about a lot of different areas of law, but we went out and wanted to make sure we got some people who were ahead of the learning curve on the issues we wanted to focus on today, uh, the intellectual property issues, the e-commerce issues, the internet law issues. Uh, and two of the people that we got um, are speaking uh, in this next segment, um, Rob Wilkes and Fraser Mann. Uh, I'll introduce Rob first and then talk to you a bit about Fraser later. Uh, Rob is a colleague of mine at Blake Castles. Uh, we went out and recruited him to the firm a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, he was uh, working, I think, on his own, um, and it was an area that we needed to beef up, and so we went and, and uh, lured Rob to the firm, where we've uh, been delighted with him ever since. He has a background in electrical engineering, and he's a trademark and patent agent, as well as being a lawyer. Um, he specializes in electronic commerce and information technology related matters. Uh, he's a past chair of the Toronto Computer Lawyers Group and he serves on the executive of the uh, Toronto Patent and Trademark Group and the Computer Related Technology Committee of the Patent and Trademark Institute of Canada. Um, he also speaks uh, quite frequently to um, CLE programs. Uh, last week he was speaking to the Canadian Corporate Council Association on e-commerce issues. Um, and a little bit before that, he spoke to uh, a Canadian Institute program on net called, that was entitled NetLaw 99, and he spoke on enforceable electronic uh, contracting. Um, so if, uh, if Rob will start off, and uh, Fraser will follow in a few minutes. Thanks a lot, Greg. I'm going to have to tone down that resume. It uh, may make me sound a little better than I am, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to take a look at some intellectual property issues and some e-commerce issues. Fraser will, we've sort of split this up, so Fraser will also deal with some intellectual property issues and some e-commerce issues. So if you see some gaping holes in what I'm talking about, hopefully Fraser will fill those in. Um, one thing that's not evident from the fact scenario is why is our client buying this business? and uh, Stan mentioned a bit about that. In addition to the uh, reasons for buying this business, we might not care about the technology at all. We might not care about the people. We want to buy the customers. 
So that's something that would be very helpful to know. We don't know about that, so I'm just going to deal with the issues uh, generally and based upon what I think might be important and also what I think is sort of hot today. Um, intellectual property is a, it's a bundle of rights. You need to look at the function of each right and apply them to the, to the target company to see what's really important in a particular situation. The, in our fact scenario, probably every intellectual property right applies except plant breeders' rights, and that's for obvious reasons. Uh, you need to, or you can, use all of those rights together in order to properly protect a uh, computer-related technology company. So in, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, patents, trade secrets, industrial designs, integrated circuit topographies, and trademarks. You can see we've got a lot to cover, and I'm going to move fairly quickly. Uh, to look briefly on the other side, the e-commerce issues, e-commerce is really a, a term for how business is being conducted. Um, one definition that I have of e-commerce uh, for a business association in the area is electronic commerce incorporates all value transactions involving the transfer of information, products, services, or payments via electronic networks. Uh, this includes the use of electronic communication as the medium through which goods and services of economic value are designed, produced, advertised, cataloged, inventoried, purchased, and where accounts are settled. Uh, obviously, we've got an e-commerce company in this case because it's using its website in order to sell product. The reason I read that definition to you is uh, to point out that, that e-commerce is not a new area of law. It's not an area of law. Um, I try to tell my partners it is an area of law, and they tell me it isn't, and really they're winning. Um, it's, it's a way of doing business that results in an expansion of existing traditional areas, uh, such as those we're, we're dealing with today, taxation, intellectual property, corporate commercial. Uh, many other areas are also affected by e-commerce, and we're not dealing with some of those. For example, marketing and advertising, it's very important, and we're not going to touch on it today. Uh, Obviously, I, I can't talk about all these areas today, so I'm going to hit some high points. I'll try to, to get a general IP overview, uh, hit some detail points on IP where I think they might be particularly interesting, and I'll provide some, um, some of the hot issues in, in e-commerce that are relevant to computer-related technology companies. Some of these issues may not have an actual effect on the share purchase uh, agreement that we have in the, in the materials, but it's good to know about them when you're dealing with these companies so that you can uh, be familiar with the client's business and the issues that are or should be important to them on a day-to-day -day basis. In the intellectual property side, uh, if you look at the fact scenario, there's mention of, of a few phrases such as electronic device and uh, recently created new and innovative applications for the product. Well, you should immediately be starting to think patents. Um, what's a patent? A patent is a description of an invention, and it's followed by a set of claims that define the patent holder's exclusive rights to make, use, and sell an invention. And an invention is something that's new, it's never been done before, and non-obvious, something that a, a skilled technician would not have been led to with the general knowledge in the area and without the exercise of some inventive ingenuity. Uh, an invention has to involve a functional aspect. Uh, you can't just have a mere aesthetic uh, improvement uh, uh, even if it's new and non-obvious. That test can be a very tough one, and, but in this case it's pretty simple. Uh, we've got an electronic device, and it, there are new and innovative applications. We're in the patent field. There's just no question about it. Uh, we should also recognize that most electronic devices are controlled by software. And uh, new in, the new and innovative applications mentioned in the fact scenario are probably software products. Uh, and if you take anything away from today uh, related to patents, this is it. Software is patentable. And, uh, we can get into technical discussions about how it's done in various countries, but, the, but it can be done and it's doable. Uh, and and the, the, 
The other area that's really hot right now, and it's not in our fact scenario, is methods of doing business. And uh, last year, uh, top level courts in the United States recognized that an intangible stock price, just a stock price, is tangible for the purpose for patent purposes. And what that did was moved us in a whole new area of patents for things like financial services and financial instruments. And uh, that's where the United States is going. Basically, the court sort of took the patent world into the information age. And, uh, and you'll hear a lot of discussion about that. And you hear a lot of people saying software isn't patentable, methods of business aren't patentable. Well, take another look when you hear those, when you hear that, and maybe there's a huge amount of value in that. And it could be a very important part of the transaction. Canada, <coughs> excuse me, Canada is not. Canada is not as advanced as the United States in the patent field, but given time, we may get there if we ever get a case. Um, patents have a number of disadvantages. They're, they're quite expensive to obtain. They're territorial. Each country you need a patent in. And they require disclosure of the invention. However, they're very, very strong uh, because they're the only form of intellectual property, well, the one major form of intellectual property that can be innocently infringed. I can put my product out, never having seen the other guy's product, and tomorrow I can be sued on a patent. I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm in big trouble. The, for ownership of patents, the person that originally owns the rights to apply for the patent is the inventor. Unless there's an agreement to the contrary or the inventor, inventor created it within the scope of their employment. If it was created within the scope of the employment, then it belongs to the company or the, to the employer. Uh, life's a great deal easier when you have cooperative inventors, but you don't have to have cooperative inventors in these transactions. You can get around that. But one thing we want to know when we're doing a transaction is whether we have people who are being cooperative. Pat, as I mentioned, patent rights are generally national, and although there are some treaties that um, reduce the requirements to, to file all over the world initially, eventually you're going to have to get into each country if you want protection. Another key thing to know is for most countries, patents must be filed uh, before disclosure takes place. There are uh, some exceptions, uh, notably in Canada and the United States, but there are those time periods that you have to know about. Moving away from patents in a related area, trade secrets. Uh, with companies in the computer area, as, as Stan mentioned, trade secrets are key. Um, the new applications that are mentioned in the fact scenario are trade secrets until they're uh, released, and the source code of the software is likely to be a trade secret. What's a trade secret? It's, sim it's simply something that's not generally known uh, that the company treats as a trade secret and does not disclose except under an air of confidentiality. Uh, most companies don't actually have patents in this, in this area uh, because of the time and the expense and the difficulty involved. Uh, so trade secrets are nice because they go on forever until the information is disclosed. The, the disadvantage with a trade secret is that uh, they can't stop someone from independently creating the trade secret. If they didn't take it from you, they're fi it's fine for them to go ahead and create it and use it. Uh, so in order to sue someone, the trade secret has to have been misappropriated from you, directly or indirectly. Uh, trade secrets are uh, generally protected by secrecy agreements. Uh, however, you can also do it by a notice or by an oral agreement. Moving from trade secrets to trademarks. These are the, the names or logos uh, under which a product or service is sold. Oh, forgive me, I should have mentioned the materials under tab 7 generally contain most of the information that I'm talking about on intellectual property. It's sort of combined in a due diligence uh, inter introduction to the due diligence sections. Uh, they, they won't be laid out the way I'm talking about them, but at least a lot of the material is there. Uh, the uh, trademarks can be registered or unregistered. Uh, registered trademarks can provide national protection. Uh, unregistered trademarks are only protected in the area in which the trademark is known. 
In our fact scenario, we've got a number of potential trademarks. We've got this pocket attic. Uh, some of them are actually registered, I think the fact scenario says. Pocket addict and uh, track buddy for the products. And we might have the cyber store for retail services. Uh, generally, in order to be registrable, a trademark cannot be descriptive of the wares, of the character quality of the wares or service with which it is used. Um, in this case, I don't have a concern with Pocket Attic and I don't have a concern with Track Buddy. Those are, those are not really descriptive. They're suggestive, but they're not descriptive. Uh, but CyberStore, that, that could be a bit of an issue as a, as a trademark. Um, as for patents, uh, trademark rights are generally national or smaller uh, in, in scope. And the one issue that's coming up in the trademark area when you start hitting the internet is uh, the use of a trademark in one country that's owned uh, by someone else or is generic in another country. And uh, this may mean that although the company has rights in Canada or possibly in the United States, they, uh, they may not have rights outside of those jurisdictions. And worse than that, they may have to compete on the internet uh, with others that have rights to the trademark outside Canada because you'll see that trademark on the internet just as much as you'll see your own. And uh, where that's all going to shake out, we're not really sure right now. Integrated circuit topographies. This is probably the one and only time you'll ever hear about these. Um, electronic devices are generally, uh, generally incorporate integrated circuits. Integrated circuits have a, a three-dimensional circuit embedded into them on a piece of silicon. The layout of the integrated circuit been, can be the subject of an integrated circuit topography registration, which is it's similar to a copyright on the uh, integrated circuit, but you have to actually register that uh, uh, in order to have protection. Don't forget that these exist, but I'm not going to say anything more because in the five years that we've had the Act, there have only been 20 registrations made, so it's not really a, a big area right now. Industrial, moving to industrial designs, these are the, uh, the, the case for this product, pocket attic or the track body. They may have a design element to, to them, uh, and that can be the subject of an industrial design application or a registration. In the United States, you may have heard of these as design, design patents. Uh, industrial design registrations protect the, the aesthetic features of functional articles. So that's, uh, in other words, how something looks, not how it works. And industrial designs have to be registered to be protected, and they're owned by the proprietor of the design. And the proprietor is the author, uh, unless the design was executed for another person. So the, what you have to watch here is the ownership on these different rights is different um, depending, well, excuse me, it's different for each of the rights. That's really what you want to see. Patents, uh, they come up, and the, uh, they're owned by the inventor or the employer. Here we've got the proprietor, which is a wider definition. <coughs> and that, that sort of draws to a close what I want to talk about on intellectual property, but you can see that there are all these different rights. They all fit together. They, ha they all have a different purpose. I want to move on to the, to the e-commerce area. And one thing, I'm going to be talking a bit during the due diligence section, so you can also, I'll also be bringing up, uh, trying to tie those areas a little bit more into our fact scenario there. Um, for for e-commerce, uh, as I mentioned, you've got all the traditional areas to deal with. I'm going to pick out uh, a few, privacy, jurisdiction, and uh, electronic contracting. Uh, privacy is not purely an e-commerce topic. It, it's, we're concerned with the personal information in any form. And personal information is information associated with an identifiable individual. For example, your address and your phone number uh, together with your name, that's personal information. And privacy issues have been around for a long time, but they're coming to the forefront really because of, uh, of computer technology and the, the ability to store and sort vast amounts of data. Uh, and then 
uh, both to sell that, but also there are also concerns when it's used internally, security concerns about allowing people to access that data. In our fact scenario, the privacy comes up in a number of uh, places, a couple of places. One is the uh, uh, this track buddy storing vast amounts of data and the sales guys running around with this data. Well, it says they've got technical data, but 10 to 1, mostly they've got their contacts on there. And they've got information about a whole lot of people in a whole lot of places. And also, CyberStore collects information when it does transactions, um, credit card information, financial information. We've got privacy legislation in Quebec. Uh, there is legislation in, in Europe. Uh, there is no other legislation in Canada specifically on the issue gen generally for the private sector. Um, but Bill C C-54 you may have heard of, it's, on, it's in the works. It's possible it could be passed by the summertime, although there are a lot of issues there. It could create a whole regulatory environment around this personal information, what you're, how you're allowed to collect it, use it, and disclose it and the security requirements that you have to put around that data. Uh, although we don't have legislation, we do have in different sectors lots of privacy codes, uh, Canadian Bankers Association, Canadian Direct Marketing Association. We probably don't have any uh, that are relevant to our fact scenario right now, but it, it's possible that there may be some privacy issues there. And it, that legislation, if Bill C-54 comes through, it's going to be particularly tricky for asset transactions because that involves a disclosure from one company to another. So just even the transaction may be a problem. Nevertheless, the company's use of the, uh, of the information. Jurisdictions, uh, another uh, area that's very hot. Um, we just had the BrainTech decision in BC. And there seem to be one or two decisions coming out every, uh, every couple of weeks in the United States. The concern is that by going on the internet, you may have opened yourself up to lawsuits around the world and being uh, dragged into court all around the world. Uh, really, when the, when the dust settles on this, it's going to be a risk-benefit analysis. Uh, is the risk worth it? And one of the ways you can reduce that risk is to have really good online terms and conditions uh, surrounding the jurisdiction issue. Uh, but ultimately, if your business wants to make money around the world, they're going to go ahead and do this, and, and they run the risk of uh, being uh, covered by these laws in other jurisdictions. There is mention in the fact scenario about an EDI agreement, and that brings up the electronic uh, contracting issues. Uh, it, Electronic contracting is fairly simple. Uh, if I make an offer and you accept it and there's consideration, we get a contract and there isn't any problem. The, uh, in order to evidence that, I can put up a little screen and say, do you accept my terms and conditions? I and you put up the terms and conditions and you click the button, I accept. You got your contract and now you have some evidence. If you don't uh, accept, you click I don't accept and off you go and you don't get to uh, follow through with that transaction. It all sounds pretty simple, but when you look at the uh, credit card issuers' statistics on that they do, they have 50% of their fraud problems on the internet, but they have 2% uh, of their money coming from the internet. You know there's more of a problem than, than uh, that simple statement would, uh, would suggest. And the fraud and problems come out mainly because you've got an open network and you don't know who's at the other end. If you walk into the store, you see the person there, uh, you can deal with them. On the internet, you can't see the people at the other end. And there are a number of groups that are trying to deal with that issue. You may have heard of the, the Identris project. And what you're trying to do is identify the, the person on the other side and then make them bound to that identity so that you can actually trace it back and, and enforce your contract. Uh, and do this around the world real time uh, between parties that don't know each other. An EDI agreement was an earlier form of that uh, to deal with the, the issues related to, uh, to waive signature and writing requirements and also to indicate when you're bound um, using, uh, when you use uh, electronic commerce in a closed, in a closed network. So I hope I've, uh, I've outlined some of the issues there. I'm run, I've run out of time. 
Um, but um, perhaps after Fraser, if we have some questions, we'll all be pleased to address them. Thanks very much. Um, that's, that's a pretty whirlwind tour of uh, a lot of uh, intellectual property concepts and some e-property concepts. We'll give uh, Rob another chance to come back and, and talk about how those, how those concepts apply in our fix, fact situation and how they apply in trying to buy this business. Um, our next speaker is Fraser Mann. Uh, Fraser is uh, another expert in the area that we, we were uh, very pleased to uh, agreed to speak to us today. He's a partner in the Toronto office of Bennett Jones. Uh, if you didn't know, they have a, an up-and-coming uh, Toronto office of, uh, as they're on their way to becoming a full national law firm. Uh, he's the author of several texts in the area. Uh, the first major um, Canadian text on um, computer law, computer technology, and the law. He's also editor-in-chief of a publication entitled Information and Technology Law. And uh, he's also the co-author of Internet Law, a uh, practical guide for legal and business professionals. Um, and without further ado, I'll ask Fraser to come up and continue the, uh, the themes that Rob was uh, starting on. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Um, there is a handout, uh, the part of the punishment that I have, or I guess perhaps that you have for the fact that I didn't get it in quite on a timely basis is that it's not actually inserted, at least it wasn't inserted in my binder in tab three. That's where it should appear. Uh, it was in the pocket at the beginning, I think, or at the, the front of the binder. Uh, just to follow up on some of the issues that uh, Rob spoke about, what I'd like to uh, discuss are some of the copyright issues that arise from the business conducted by CyberStore, focusing on the software that they use in their business, as set out in the fact situation, and also copyright issues that might arise based on the uh, new business that they're in concerning uh, TrackBuddy and the sale of that unit, which is used primarily for downloading music from the internet. I'll also talk, uh, talk a little bit about the domain name issue and tie that in perhaps a little bit to the trademark issue that uh, Rob spoke about and uh, deal just briefly with uh, some of the agreements that should be in place. Uh, it's not clear from the fact situation whether they are, but agreements that should be in place relating to the, the structural arrangements as far as the electronic commerce conducted by uh, CyberStore. Now, on the copyright issues, we have to start with a, a few basic principles, and the first one is really that the, whoever creates a work owns copyright in a work, and that includes computer software. Computer software is clearly protected under the Copyright Act. Uh, the only exception really to that general rule is that uh, if a work is created by, a, by an employee uh, under a contract of service, and it's made in the course of employment, and those are important terms, then the employer, employer will be the first owner of copyright in the absence of a contrary agreement. And apart from that rule, uh, in order for any assignment of copyright to take place, it must be in writing from the author to any assignee or from one owner to another then. Uh, now, applying those principles to the fact situation as we have it, and perhaps I should just, before I do that, I just want to touch on what is called moral rights. Uh, these are often overlooked, but it's uh, something which uh, should be dealt with. These are the rights of someone, an author, only an author, to be associated with the work, to be named as the creator or the author of the work, and also what is called the right of integrity, and even though that is, uh, was, I think, intended originally for artistic works, it, does, it is not limited to that. And the right of integrity means the right to prevent changes to work that might injure one's honor and reputation, or reputation. And you can question whether or not that should be applicable to software, but in fact, in, in principle, it is. So looking at what we have here, we know that there are three categories of software 
and perhaps you could even say four categories. We know that there is software that was created or developed initially by the majority shareholder. There was software that was created by the employees and consultants, and then the software that's licensed from third parties. Now, for the first category of software, uh, it's clear from the fact situation that uh, while this shareholder, the majority shareholder, may be an employee now, that's not clear, but in any event, the software was developed before CyberStore was incorporated. So what that means is that it was not developed by him uh, as an employee acting in the course of employment. And therefore, what you would have to look for is a written assignment of copyright from the majority shareholder. Now, with respect to the employees and consultants, well, that there again, I think we have to look at uh, that in uh, terms of the employees first and then the consultants. Uh, if the employees wrote the software while they were true employees and it was made in the course of employment based on such factors as whether <clears throat> it was related to their duties as employees and whether they used the equipment and facilities and so on of the employer, then uh, there should be uh, ownership in the software vested in the employer as a matter of law. However, in the case of consultants, Again, you would have to look for written assignments of copyright from the consultants. And I should say it's common in these cases, <coughs> excuse me, to have written agreements with employees and consultants that deal with the non-disclosure of any trade secrets, including software, and also really just to confirm the ownership of the software by the employer. So you would expect a company like CyberStore, which is in the business that it's in, to have these written agreements. <clears throat> now, as far as the software license from third parties, uh, and we see that some of that software is incorporated in TrackBuddy. So it appears, in other words, that there is a kind of, some kind of reseller agreement in place. And there are a number of questions that you would have to ask. <clears throat> First, uh, uh, of course, there is, that means that there is a license agreement that permits, that at least should permit, uh, CyberStore to incorporate <clears throat> the third-party software as part of TrackBuddy, uh, maybe modify and adapt the software so it can be integrated with the other components. Uh, and then you would have to ask the question, what is the scope of the license rights granted to CyberStore? Can it uh, relicense or uh, distribute the software uh, around the world? And considering, again, the way in which uh, CyberStore is conducting business over the internet, that is certainly the kind of rights that you would want to look for. Uh, what requirements must be met? What requirements are imposed on CyberStore in terms of sublicensing the software? Because even though we're talking about the sale of the units of TrackBuddy, what is done there, or what should be done at least, is that for the software components of TrackBuddy that originate from a third party, there should be a sublicense granted. There should be the right to grant a sublicense. And you need to find out, for example, whether there needs to be an acknowledgement signed by end users, whether there needs to be a click wrap license agreement, uh, such as Rob discussed, uh, made that would, would protect the rights of the third party licensors. You would need to look and tr look at the uh, term of any license, what the provisions are for renewal from the uh, third-party licensor, and then uh, what is very important, of course, when we're talking about the sale of the business of CyberStore, whether it's an asset sale or a share sale, uh, what requirements are imposed uh, in terms of obtaining the consent of the licensor uh, is there any requirement for transfer fees to be payable in order to permit an assignment of the license to the buyer if it's an asset sale? Or are there any requirements for getting the consent of the licensor uh, even if it's a, a sale of shares and there is a change of control of CyberStore? Now, the, the copyright issues that arise from the, the manufacture and sale of track buddy, and uh, this is certainly 
a very interesting issue. Uh, I think you've all heard of MP3 and how important that is for the music industry. Uh, even Pamela Wallen uh, had the full hour the other night devoted to that issue. And certainly the music rights societies, the collectives, are taking a very keen interest in this issue. And I think we can be certain that they would be very interested in the business conducted by CyberStore. Now, there may be many rights holders who are affected, maybe the, the owners of the rights in the actual musical works, uh, in the sound recordings that might be downloaded, in the actual performances of those uh, musical works. Um, and there uh, may be a number of, of rights involved because of the way in which works can be downloaded over the internet. There may be uh, the reproduction right, and there may be multiple reproductions uh, involved in terms of the downloading of works over the internet. There may be the public performance right, or more specifically, the communication of the right to the public, uh, which is held, again, by collectives. And on that issue, there is a decision that will be handed down uh, quite soon, probably within the next two months, from the Copyright Board, dealing with the issue of the liability for the transmission of musical works over the internet. So you would certainly uh, want to take a look at that decision when it comes down. Now, you can say, and it again, again it appears from the fact situation that uh, CyberStore itself is not necessarily downloading music from the internet. What it is doing is that it is manufacturing the devices and selling those the devices that will permit uh, its customers to download music. And you may say, well, uh, it's the customers and not CyberStore that is involved in terms of uh, any, for example, if they're downloading music that is not authorized to be on the internet. Uh, what you need to consider, though, is that there is a provision in the Copyright Act that talks about the authorization of any rights that are reserved to the copyright owner. And uh, authorization has been interpreted in various cases. Uh, it seems that the supply of equipment that may be used for infringement by itself would not be considered an infringing activity. That is not considered as authorizing the infringement by another party. However, there are uh, interpretations of that term that talk about encouraging or sanctioning or countenancing the infringement of other parties. And I think what you would want to look at very carefully is the way in which uh, the track buddy product is marketed, the way in which it's advertised, the way in which uh, uh, the information is provided to potential purchasers over the internet and consider whether any of those activities may uh, put CyberStore offside in terms of the, uh, the Copyright Act. Now on the domain name issue, and I don't have a lot of time, so I won't spend uh, a lot of time dealing with it, but uh, we noted in the fact situation again that cyberstore.com had been registered by a U.S. entrepreneur um, and uh, in, in some circles that entrepreneur would be called a cyber pirate or cyber squatter. Uh, it's not clear that Cyberstore itself was a prior trademark, but considering the nature of the business of this entrepreneur, presumably he has uh, tried to get ahead of trademark owners or owners of famous trademarks and registered those marks as uh, domain names. And based on the way in which the domain name system has been set up, uh, he would be able to do that because it's basically a first come, first served system. Whoever gets to the registry first uh, and provided that there is not really an identical uh, domain name already registered, then it can be registered. Now, of course, uh, as you can understand, that raises uh, serious questions in terms of trademarks. Uh, there are a number of decisions now in the U.S. There was a decision just a couple of weeks ago by the Ninth uh, Circuit Court of Appeals that found that the later registration of a domain name 
is not going to prevail over the earlier rights to a trademark. So uh, the, uh, what that means is that if CyberStore has been used as a trademark, and particularly if it has been registered as a trademark uh, previously by any entity, then if you are prepared to go to court, at least you may uh, uh, have the domain name removed or have require the rights to be assigned to you. Um, now that's not a process that a lot of people want to go through and uh, I can understand why CyberStore found it worthwhile to spend the $10,000 in order to buy the rights to the domain name from the US entrepreneur, but that doesn't resolve the issue because you have to find out whether or not CyberStore is also being used as a trademark and you would want to consider uh, the, uh, you would want to do searches to find out whether it's a trademark in any jurisdiction. You would also want to consider searches under other domain name registries. Uh, CyberStore is registered as a .com name, which is in the US, of course, through internet and now through ICANN. Uh, but CyberStore.ca might have been registered through the Canadian Registration Authority. So uh, there may be a conflict there. Uh, I should point out that WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, is trying to deal with uh, the problems with the domain name system internationally, and particularly dealing, they're trying to deal with conflicts between domain names and uh, trademarks, and there are reports that have been issued. There was a last report issued just uh, April 30th uh, with a series of recommendations uh, but it will be up to the various domain name registries in various countries as to whether to implement those uh, recommendations. Now, uh, in view of time, I won't spend uh, much time dealing with these issues, but I did touch on some of what I would call the structural agreements relating to the electronic commerce arrangements that CyberStore may have in place. Um, for example, in terms of the agreements with the parties who are responsible for developing and maintaining the website that is used by CyberStore, uh, you would want to know what arrangements are in place to ensure the security of the transactions. This is used for electronic commerce and actual payment processing over the internet. You would want to ensure that uh, all necessary uh, impossible arrangements are uh, put in place to prevent any unauthorized tampering with information that is stored on the servers. Uh, you want to know where CyberStore's website is uh, uh, registered in terms of search engines so that it can be easily uh, found. You would want to know what links are made to the site uh, from other sites and what links are made to other sites. Um, and then, then you would also, in terms of the uh, agreement with the party responsible for developing the website, you'd want to deal with the ownership issue to make sure that any of the, the graphics and all of the material on the website is in fact owned by CyberStore. Uh, if there was pre-existing content that was used by the developer in order to create the website, then you would want to know that you have the, all the rights necessary to use that content. Um, in terms of web hosting, um, the website, of course, has to be installed and operated on a web server, and that may be located at CyberStore's uh, location, its premises, or in many cases, it will be operated on behalf of CyberStore by an ISP or a web presence provider. Um, the internal hosting is uh, really more appropriate in this situation where there is a need for a high level of security and uh, where there's uh, a need for the, uh, the website to be used to support real-time transactions and there may also be a linking of the um, server to other databases in order to permit the processing of the, uh, uh, any orders that are made by customers. Um, if you do have a web hosting agreement, you'd want to know whether it's a dedicated server or a shared server, uh, and then you would also want to know what the guarantees are in terms of service levels, what the hours of operation are, 
what the commitments are in terms of uh, response time, if there are any problems with the operation of the server. Um, you'd want to know what the bandwidth uh, provisions are in terms of the, uh, the bandwidth between the, uh, the ISP that is hosting the website and the primary uh, internet backbone. Um, you'd want to know what kinds of reports have to be provided, uh, who's visiting the website, obviously, and uh, what marketing information can be provided. Um, and you'd want to know how the fees are, are to be calculated in terms of any uh, charges payable to the party providing the hosting services, whether they're based on the number of transactions processed or number of uh, visitors to the website. Um, and uh, because you may want to change the arrangements, arrangements you may uh, want to look at what type of services are to be provided if the web hosting agreement is terminated so that if you want to bring it in-house or if you want to move to another service provider, you may do so. Um, that's uh, a quick overview of some of the issues with, uh, with the issues that Rob has raised and I will also be back later to talk about reps and warranties, um, but I guess both Rob and I, if, uh, we, we can take questions for a minute or two. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I don't think they do, and uh, the, the point that Rob made, which is that you're, what are you doing this from a legal perspective? You are, uh, at least in a practical sense, doing business around the world. And you are trying to do it from a web, one website located on one server in one jurisdiction. And usually you're doing that only through one company. And there may be other situations. You may set up mirror sites in other jurisdictions in some cases, or you may uh, set up a subsidiary or related company in the U.S. to do it from there. It depends on circumstances, but at least in the PAC situation before, is it appears that it's only one website carried on or conducted by one one company. But it's almost worse in a lot of cases because you had previously different companies all over the world doing marketing, and then but now they're bringing together those companies into one single website that one site is over the world. So the answer is maybe that we'll see that not happening as much as it may start to go back as the individual companies or the individual jurisdictions that have their site clients have problems with the other We don't know the different companies that we have. The, uh, the, right. the, the case in the U.S. that I, I alluded to, the Ninth um, Circuit Court of Appeals, found that there was uh, use for trademark purposes not when the domain name was registered, which was in 96 in that case, but when they actually started using it in terms of the actual ele electronic commerce and so on, which was 98. So that uh, the fact that you register a name as a domain name, put it up on a website as a domain name, does not by itself, it appears at least in that case, constitute usage for trademark purposes. Uh, well, you're, you're looking, what you're looking for is the sale or whatever requirements there are in terms of trademark usage. Well, if, if see, if you, and there's, there's a difference in terms of the registration of a name as a domain name and then the actual usage on a website. The usage on the website in conjunction with the marketing of products and services may be considered as trademark usage. That's possible. But the registration of the domain name or just putting it up on the website itself, I don't think is trademark usage. And maybe Rob can comment on that. Services, it's uh, advertising is used as a trademark in Canada and the United 
States, but for a product, you have to actually have the market on the product and put that into commerce. So it, it, it's, it will all depend on the particular fact scenario. Uh, the, the, there are many cases coming out now. Basically, if you take domain names and register them and try to hold those and then try to hold the uh, uh, trademark owners up to ransom to sell them, Yes. I, ha I haven't heard of yes, a lot of cases, of but well, that's right. It's the, of course, you have to deal with the common law rules in terms of uh, passing off and so on. And uh, I think some of the cases have addressed that issue. Uh, the, uh, the situation with universities and also hospitals is quite tricky because, as you say, uh, at least the major universities have their own copyright policy. Uh, I think they have a patent policy as well. Uh, you really do have to consider whether or not they're bound by that copyright policy as a matter of uh, contract law, whether based on th th this person is a student uh, or a uh, a PhD student, uh, the, I, I'm just not sure whether or not uh, the person would be bound. If, it, if it's a uh, professor or a uh, research assistant, uh, someone who is paid in some manner by the university, uh, that person may very well be bound by the copyright policy and that may prevail over the law. But I, uh, I certainly have had a case myself where a researcher at a university who was uh, a teaching assistant had a dispute with a professor as to the ownership of uh, some software that was written uh, by the assistant. And I certainly recall uh, trying to deal with the issue in terms of the copyright policy uh, and really not having much success in terms of negotiating with the university and it became a matter of the, uh, the university taking the side of one party over another. And unless in that case you're prepared to go to court, it can be very difficult. It, it does raise very, certainly very interesting, but unique issues, if, if I can call them that. Uh, I'm not aware of any, no. Am I, one, is there, one in the US, the US no. where the guy, the, the student ended up in jail. <laughs> <laughs>
and it's something and we've heard of really uh, serious cases where people get very very personal and emotional about it so it's it's a very sensitive area